data about non-compaction cardiomyopathy. Um, so uh, yeah, Kim Conley here. Uh, so let's let's kick off. So um, this was an interesting uh, uh, young gentleman who was uh, said to me for a second opinion a couple of years ago, actually. And uh, there's a, cute, a few key features. Uh, he's a 23 year old basketball player. He um, plays NCAA basketball. So he plays for one of the US college schools, uh, actually got into the, the big four, the end of the NCAA week, which as you know, is probably one of the biggest money spinners in the world for the, for the NCAA, but not for the players. He's of African descent and no family history of relevance. And he and he'd had, uh, initially I saw him back in 2018 after he had a uh, syncopal event. And the circumstances surrounding the syncopal event were that he um, had been training very hard. It was an extremely hot day and he'd felt dizzy during the exercise workout and had stopped the workout but the coach had suggested that he go home. He then left the basketball gym, was walking home, and then has no uh, further recollection of the events other than he was found on the uh, ground there. The second event, um, which uh, we'll go into a bit more detail, but subsequently he had a, a subsequent event, um, which was a similar type of event in that he'd been playing hard again sport and he had left uh, the arena late at night when he was extremely busy, tired and had been overworked and again had felt sort of unwell during the uh, event per se, slightly dizzy and uh, then was found on the ground and at that point a ambulance was called and he was said to be having sort of a seizure-like state although it was very difficult to get the actual uh, medical records there. The best uh, history we got was from a bystander um, who didn't actually witness the event, but it was his girlfriend who had driven to meet him to pick him up after the workout and said she had uh, noticed that he was uh, lying on, on the ground there. But he was conscious and, and alert and talking to her by the time that this had occurred. He was then... Um, sent to the medical uh, clinic um, at the local hospital where he was observed. He had an ECG, I'll show you that. He had troponins, normal stuff, um, all of which was unremarkable. He was then referred to the Mayo Clinic for further workup. So I'd seen him after the 2018 uh, event and we'd done some imaging then, I'll show you some of that. And I'd felt that this was most consistent with the vasovagal event, that this was not, um, indicative of any other uh, significant pathology and that he could continue to play. And the reason he came back for a second opinion was that the Mayo doctors, and I what they thought the, or said the diagnosis was yet, but they were concerned and suggested that he be banned from competitive sport. Now, he was pretty close to being drafted to the NBA. So um, as you can imagine, uh, this is a pretty much a life-changing event. Um, he does come from, uh, you know, as I mentioned, he's African. They are, he is from a, you know, fairly uh, a poorly educated area. He's the sort of superstar of the family. He's made most of the money of the family. And so um, after he had had his second uh, syncopal event and was banned from sports, um, his father actually rang me up in a bit of a panic there. So... The initial trans thoracic that was done, we'll just give you some numbers first. Um, we'll show you what the images look like. He had a big ventricle. Now, I will remind you, this is an uh, NCAA power forward who is six foot eight. He might have been six foot nine. I think his body surface area, when you calculate it out, is almost three. So he is huge. His, uh, his thighs are bigger than my waist. Um, and he calls himself a small power forward. So... Um, remember to put the uh, findings in context. So his end diastolic dimension was 64 millimeters or when indexed, because remember because of his profound height, um, you see that his end diastolic dimensions when indexed against that huge body surface area come in at 24 and his EDV comes in at 120 mils when indexed you know, per meter squared. His ejection fraction was normal, he had normal diastolic function normal echo parameter estimates of left atrial pressure 
And you'll notice that his global longitudinal strain was minus 18.1%. It was pretty good image quality. So uh, not uh, maybe not entirely normal, maybe not entirely abnormal either. I think it's a bit of a gray zone around that minus 80%. So as you know, uh, we would always get a um, ECG on these customers and this was what his ECG uh, looked like there. And uh, there are specific sports criteria for the determination of uh, pathology. Um, and they are quite different when we consider someone who's of African or black origin. Okay, there are quite different criteria to put based on um, uh, race. Um, the other point to note is that left ventricular hypertrophy estimation in athletes is notoriously unreliable. It, in fact, using ECG criteria essentially um, is non-diagnostic. So the same criteria that we would use, you know, Lyons, Cornell, Sokolow, et cetera, is basically not useful in the athlete. Remember, he was 23, so he's young. So I think you'll all agree with me that the ECG even if you really stare for long enough, uh, there is no particular abnormalities. And of course, um, being uh, African descent, we are concerned about conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and so on. We've all seen high profile in NBA, uh, NBA athletes uh, die on the court, on the camera, unfortunately, or have VF arrest and uh, really no specific criteria there. So, um, let's just keep going on. And so here's his echo. Um, oh, unfortunately the loop's not gonna play cause it's on my Mac. Um, um, sorry about that. Um, but I think it's, uh, we can sort of go through it. So um, obviously this is the apical four chamber views. I think you'll notice straight away that his RV does look pretty, pretty, pretty large. If I remember with uh, uh, the raw volumes were around 300 ml, okay? So this is a big fellow with a big ventricle. And you'll notice there's definitely prominent um, trabeculation extending down on the anterolateral wall into the apex there. And we can see a slightly more uh, zoomed uh, view here on the right side. Um, again, demonstrating that, um, that uh, trabeculation there. So, uh, you know, I think on first value that uh, it does obviously raise a, a couple of uh, potential uh, diagnoses there. And this is the two chamber view. Um, and I, I apologize, the videos, uh, I don't know why it's not playing now, but anyway, um, again, you can see that basically the two chamber, nothing specific here on the right side, three chamber view. Again, we get a, a, a um, um, some idea that there is in fact greater trabeculation that um, we would usually expect uh, to see. But of course, um, and I'll go through this later, there are quite a lot of uh, ethnic variation in what is the normal amount of uh, trabeculation that can be seen in ventricles, in particular folks who are black or African descent there. Here is the short axis views. Um, again, really at the sort of mid pap level going slightly more apically. And again, we can see then that there is, um, you know, evidence of, uh, of, you know, these prominent uh, trabeculation there. Um, so let's keep going on. And here we go more apically. And I think you'll all agree that this looks uh, fairly significant here. Um, uh, when we look at the apical, uh, more apical views and particularly impacting the anterolateral wall there all the way down to the apex there. So um, what, uh, what we were concerned about when we saw uh, this, and to be honest, it had slightly progressed when we looked at the 2018 um, uh, images compared to the 2018 20 images, but back in 2018, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, we did, we did have an MRI. Um, it was actually read by Dinesh um, at the general because he came back um, from his uh, US school to get his medical, uh, uh, sought medical attention uh, here in Canada because he's a, he's a Canadian uh, resident. So at that stage, um, 
uh, as I said, I had ruled him uh, to be safe to play for sport. But when the Mayo Clinic saw this, they said, this is evidence of non-compaction. This is a cardiomyopathy and therefore should be banned from competitive sport. As I mentioned, that's when his father had rang me up saying, well, this is sort of gonna ruin his career, et cetera, et cetera. What do we need to do? So the question is, does he really have non-compaction or not? And the thing got a little bit more complicated was that because he uh, is a Canadian uh, citizen in the US, they wanted to implant a cardioverter defibrillator and they wanted to charge 200,000 US dollars for the implantation and the medical care surrounding the implantation of that device. And that was when I'd sort of said, well, that's absurd. Um, there's absolutely no need to pay that amount of money when we can do it here in Canada, probably for almost one tenth of the cost. So if he does need it, um, and because um, uh, of various reasons, um, he effectively was not covered in the US and the basketball, um, the uh, local school would be on the hook for paying for it. And they of course had reservations about whether or not they should pay this money. The other important thing to note is the NBA does not allow people to play um, competitive basketball in, with the presence of an implantable cardio defibrillator. Um, it's not exactly clear why we believe it's mostly because of the optics that they do not want people um, who are at potentially higher risk having episodes of sudden cardiac death because when these things are telephys, they have major implications and uh, um, to advertising and so on. So um, there are other leagues that will uh, allow folks to, uh, with defibrillators to continue to play, but the NBA, it's not an absolute blanket policy, but they are uh, uh, actively discourage it. And to my knowledge, I know of no um, current player or past player who's been unable to continue um, with once the implantable defibrillator has been placed. So you can see this is a, this you know is a big decision point in 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 moving forward. Um, but obviously we've got the background of two syncopal episodes now, um, and an, a, you know a normal ECG but a highly abnormal looking echo there. So the question is, does he have non-compaction or not? So you know if we go back and look at the various histories, you generally see that um, there is a there is a different um, differences in the diagnosis of this based on um, your race. So if we look at blacks compared to non-blacks and we look at differences in age, less than 59, 59 to 73 and greater than 73, you'll see across all strata that if you just identify patients with LV systolic dysfunction, that the likely that a clinician may make the diagnosis, whether or not it's pathologically confirmed is a different thing, is substantially greater simply based on the fact that, um, you know, as I said, if you're African descent or black, that you have very different morphology on the echocardiogram and you're more likely to have be made the diagnosis, whether or not that's true, the uh, true diagnosis, it remains unclear, but it does suggest that there are different uh, uh, racial phenotypes um, that uh, impact trabeculation, which then may impact the diagnosis of left ventricular non-compaction there. So what that essentially says is that if you just take all of these patients here and we're making the diagnosis that frequently, are the current diagnostic criteria that we've traditionally used, are they actually appropriate for to, to make a diagnosis of left ventricular non-compaction? And we know that um, uh, from other studies, and this is again a nice European uh, paper, um, and there's some pretty big names on this, Sanjay Sharma, you know, is recognized as probably the world leader in, uh, in determination of um, athletes' heart and pathology and, and athletes. Um, this is an MRI study where they looked in ethnic different differences in ventricular hypertrabeculation on cardiac MRI and elite football players. And again, you can see as we look across different locations, uh, the black represents African athletes, uh, whereas the, the gray bars represent, I guess, non-African or non-black descent um, uh, athletes, although that is predominantly, well, you know, Caucasian males. That you see again, we are much more likely, in particular, the infralateral midventricular, the anterolateral ventricular, the anterior midventricular, and the lateral apical ventricular um, locations are much more likely to have ventricular hypertrabeculation. 
And as we know, ventricular hypertrabeculation is one component of the diagnosis of non-compaction, but it is not the sole component. And in fact, in the literature, in particular driven by two folks who run a neuromuscular clinic out of Vienna, uh, whose names are Finsterer and Stolberger, they frequently describe the diagnosis of non-compaction is greater than three hypertrabeculation, which within which they term hypertrabeculation. However, the initial diagnostic criteria was uh, made when uh, other neuromuscular disorders were effectively excluded. So you had to not have a neuromuscular disorder and have evidence of significant trabeculation plus the other criteria before the Jenny and Oshlin criteria could be applied, which is the more contemporary diagnosis of left ventricular non-compaction. So you can see here that now we've got a bit of a discrepancy between a sort of phenotypic phenotypic appearance, which is then being labeled as non-compaction and which is quite different from the actual uh, diagnosis, the true diagnosis pathologically confirmed and proven by Jenny and Oshlin, which is the true syndrome of left ventricular non-compaction. So you can see here that it's a very different phenotype based on your uh, uh, race then. So this was the conclusion from this paper, a greater degree of left ventricular hypertrabeculation is seen in healthy African athletes um, combined with biventricular EF reduction at risk. So this is important to know this to avoid misdiagnosis of non-compaction. And obviously in this person, um, uh, you know, it does make a big difference in um, uh, the impact on his life moving forward. Um, now, how frequently do we see trabeculations in athletes? Well, we see them fairly significantly. This is not a benign thing. So if we look at this study here, again, uh, this was the prominence of, uh, you know, greater than two or more trabeculations in this particular study where they looked at 1,146 athletes compared to, you know, age match control. So we're not comparing old to young here, you know, mean age 20 odd, young healthy folks, BSA is around two, good blood pressure, so exclusion of, of hypertension, like most studies, unfortunately, predominantly male, we can see that uh, it's fairly common that you see in athletes, um, uh, it, you know, this uh, evidence of significant number of trabeculation. And then as you go across sports, you see that it varies based on the particular sport. However, if we look at the absolute um, diagnosis based on your race, again, you'll see compared to Caucasians who, um, you know, uh, were predominantly um, of, uh, made up the predominant numbers in this group that um, you are more likely again to see trabeculations in that African American group. And again, you'll see this particular group of athletes uh, were what we really um, uh, rate the sort of uh, professional level athletes doing almost 18 hours a week of, of, of training there. So for the most part, you know, we tend to uh, sort of uh, break it down into uh, really zero to nine, nine to around 18 hours, and then greater than 18 hours a week, we generally call that sort of elite or a professional type athlete. So these were, you know, these were folks that were exercising a lot per week. This wasn't your, your sort of weekend uh, warrior, uh, so to speak there. So basically take home messages, we see trabeculations quite frequently. And again, when you look at that, and this was, as I mentioned, greater than or equal to three trabeculations that had to be greater than or equal to three millimeters in width. So uh, reasonably uh, good criteria to diagnose what, what these trabeculations were, um, that again, it's seen significantly more in the African, uh, uh, um, uh, African Afro-Caribbean uh, uh, population compared to Caucasians. Um, and also we see it uh, differently paced on different sports. So in the most dynamic sports, uh, high dynamic sports of which basketball is considered, we are again more likely to, to see it. So you can see in our um, uh, uh, fellow here, the question is, you know, was really this sort of uh, 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 the end of the spectrum of, of a normal variant or is it indeed uh, non-compaction cardiomyopathy there? And so again, a lot of folks have gone back, and this was DN data back in 2013, to look at the various criteria. And as you know, that um, we look at the presence 
of the uh, hypertrabeculation, typically impacting the anterolateral wall, extending into the apex. And then the criteria also describe the ratio of the end systolic um, non-compacted compared to compacted. And if it's you know usually greater than say 2.1, then we say that that's other evidence to support the true diagnosis of non-compaction cardiomyopathy, along with the presence of flow in the intertrabecular recesses uh, there and of, uh, also excluding other neuromuscular disorders. If we look at those criteria and we apply them to black persons compared to Caucasians, um, uh, again, we see significant differences based on the diagnostic uh, criteria. And these are just athletes that we see who may fulfill the criteria of non-compaction, even though there may be no other abnormalities which actually support the diagnosis of non-compaction cardiomyopathy. So again, this makes us rethink, well, are the diagnostic criteria which are originally designed predominantly in a Caucasian non-athlete population, are they relevant when we consider them in a, a, a black athlete population, in particular those who undergo um, high dynamics sport? And also remember in that group, uh, they further stratified based on abnormal ECG and our gentleman had a completely normal ECG. And one of the things that they've developed at the Mayo Clinic is using their AI, they run all their ECGs through this uh, AI machine learning algorithm, which is fairly accurate at determining what the, the, uh, whether the ECG is normal or abnormal and whether it fits a, an underlying pathology. And I can tell you that the Mayo, when he was sent there, said that the ECG uh, also concurred that it was entirely normal there. So if we look at um, determinants of increased LV trabeculations, if we look at um, um, uh, univariate analysis on various studies, you know, we can see race and T-wave inversion uh, are the most likely uh, uh, things that are associated with increased LV trabeculations. But in fact, once you adjust for eth ethnic background, that in fact T-wave inversion is the best. But interestingly, age, sex, body surface area, hours of training, LV size or wall thickness uh, are not uh, a good um, uh, a criteria in your univariate analysis to determine LV uh, trabeculations there. So it's really race and T-wave inversion there. So, um, you know, what other uh, ways, you know, what other data have we, have we, we, we got to um, uh, help understand uh, what's going on in this particular population? And this is, um, a, again, looking at uh, how we can deal with this syndrome of uh, significant trabeculations and help identify, well, who actually has the cardiomyopathy and who actually just merely has a, a, has a, 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 you know, a, a normal variant, so to speak. So this is looking at over 2,500. You'll see Rolf Jenny and it was Jenny and Irwin who really were the ones that did the original diagnostic criteria for uh, non-compaction when he was in uh, Switzerland. 2,501 athletes screen, um, non-compaction, uh, was diagnosed with LV dysfunction with an EF less than 50% and or positive family history and genetic testing, which is positive in one athlete, and exclusion of non-compaction regardless of the extent of trabeculations if you had normal LV function, a negative family history of uh, cardiomyopathy there. And you can see that of this group that was screened, 2,465, 36 had prominent LV trabeculation, so 1.4%. Um, based on the criteria on the left there, it was thought that 24 uh, were completely excluded from the diagnosis, nine it was unlikely, and that out of this particular cohort that maybe three or 0.1% they could confirm a diagnosis. So uh, again, it is uncommon. We expect to see non-compaction in a normal echo lab like St. Michael's, about one in every or two in every 10,000 echoes that are read. So this still remains an uncommon um, uh, diagnosis, um, but as I said, uh, you know, depending on uh, a racial group that might modify that. So they then came um, up with, well, what should we do if you identify someone with prominent trabeculations, a normal ECG? And again, this is not really directly relevant to our customer because he had syncope, so I think that does impact it. But if you confirm it based on the EF being low, um, confirmation on an alternate imaging modality such as CMR or genetic testing that sports restriction um, uh, should be advised and that you undergo clinical follow-up and uh, screen the family. 
If it's unlikely, you then undergo sport participation allowed with periodic follow-up. And if, um, if it's excluded, well then you just can continue on. But the exclusion criteria you'll see, you have to fulfill a number of uh, uh, criteria. Negative family history, asymptomatic, normal LV and systolic and diastolic function, normal ECG, no ventricular arrhythmias, and no disease confirmation with CMR or genetic testing. So it does suggest once you've identified LV trabeculations, it's not just, oh, trabeculations, you're okay, continue on. We would have to undergo a number of criteria to basically confirm the exclusion, in which case they then can participate. If not, then you fall into the categories of the left there. So it does suggest that you do require significant further testing to confirm the diagnosis. So we still now have a bit of a conundrum with our fellow. He's had his syncope, and I can tell you that I, I uh, when he had the second ep episode of syncope, I was a little bit concerned, uh, obviously, and thought, damn, maybe I'd misdiagnosed at the beginning, um, uh, and that uh, maybe he did have non-compaction. And there's a few other things that I'd done at that time, which made me uh, 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 help make the diagnosis. We can talk about those, but I'd actually sent him along to, uh, to Paul Dorian to get an opinion uh, regarding the syncopal episodes. And uh, Paul had done a bit more digging and actually had a long chat with the uh, um, girlfriend um, and uh, you know got some more data. And then ultimately uh, got a little bit more information from the medical records at the, uh, at the hospital. And essentially um, based on that data, um, it became fairly clear that in fact, he had not just been walking along and suddenly collapsed. He had left the gym and he had noticed that whenever he had a significant change in his posture that he was becoming more lightheaded and dizzy. And that was in fact the thing that had uh, promoted, you know, led to him leaving the actual gym. Um, and, and he was actually going to buy a whole lot of water and Gatorade because he recognized that he was probably fairly volume depleted. It was a very hot day and he trained for two or three hours. So there was a significant postural component to his syncope. And in fact, when we went back and I looked at my, my notes from the original consult, again, he described this postural component. So we felt this, that, that, that this was in fact, not you know, cardiogenic syncope per se, but really related to volume depletion and other things. However, we still had the issue of the Mayo uh, saying he's banned from sport. And it's pretty hard to move against the Mayo. They're obviously a big famous group. And the NCA, NCA, NCAA was sort of said, look, we don't really care who, what you guys say in Toronto. Um, uh, if the Mayo say it, then that's what we're gonna do. So that's when I contacted Erwin and said, look, Erwin, we've got this gentleman, what should we do moving forward? And this is sort of one of the newer concepts in trying to understand the dividing between what is trabeculation as an abnormal variant and what is actually a hypertrabeculation that's associated with the non-compaction syndrome, uh, which as we know, would then result in banning of sport and potentially you know, implantation of ICDs and medical therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I just wanna remind everyone of how the heart contracts um, and the pro principles of rotational strain and twist. So as you know, although we measure global longitudinal strain and we can measure radial and circumfer circumferential strain, these are vectors within which we can look at the various components as to the shortening or thickening of the heart but the heart in fact does not contract through necessarily a true apical debate shortening or simply a radial thickening. What it actually does is undergo a twist. And it's that twisting motion which then results in ejection of blood from the heart. And we all know that if you take a towel and put it in water and, and it becomes very wet and you wanna dry it because you wanna dry yourself, you don't get two people to just simply pull on it or squish it together. That doesn't work. You get one person to hold one end and rotate usually counterclockwise and the person on the other end grabs it and, um, and, and rotates clockwise. And by doing so, it concertinas up on itself a bit like the helical DNA binding together. And that is in fact the most effective way to wring the fluid from your towel. And it's in fact the same principle that we know the heart undergoes. The bay, when the heart contracts, because of the right and left um, fiber orientation in the epicardium and the endocardium, that the base of the heart undergoes a clockwise, a clockwise rotation, um, as you can see here, um, with these left and right-handed fibers that occur 
essentially uh, 90 degrees to each other. And the apex, in fact, undergoes a counterclockwise rotation. And that, in fact, of course, explains why with that counterclockwise rotation with the base of the heart being essentially sort of fixed, that you feel the apex beat because it rotates around, it lifts, and that's the, the, the force of the apex beat that you feel. So on the right here, you can see then um, that the fibers undergo slightly different orientation. So if we look here at the myocardial fibers in the subendocardium, they'll undergo this clockwise rotation at the base and counterclockwise at the apex. However, if we look at the sub um, endocardium, you see at the base of the heart, there's this counterclockwise rotation and the apex of the heart will be a clockwise rotation. So uh, we can see here that this may then be useful when we're trying to understand a pathology that involves compacted and non-compacted fibers because it may then modify the twisting of the heart. And in fact, that's probably why you get abnormalities in, in systolic uh, function that we see. So this concept was came up a number of years ago. This was uh, first put through by a, you know, a, a Dutch group, the diagnostic value of rigid body rotation in non-compaction uh, cardiomyopathy. So essentially uh, using strain imaging, torsion or twist um, can easily, quite easily be uh, uh, assessed, particularly with the uh, GE software. You just need to tick a box. Um, and once you identify the basal and apical segments, it can track those in either a clockwise or a counterclockwise uh, rotation, and we can then label those segments. And that's indeed what's, what's uh, been uh, done here. So you'll see in the sort of green diamond here, this is the apical segment. Um, and the red diamond is uh, 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 designated here by the um, 1B. And then if we look at the basal segment again, we can give it uh, this uh, green circle there and uh, 1B will be the basal segment. And what I wanted to bring your attention to is, so this is the amount of rotation that a normal heart will go through um, during uh, the normal cardiac cycle here. So as I said, you'll initially get that um, uh, 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 end systolic clockwise um, basal and counterclockwise apical rotation. So you can see here that the uh, rotation at the apex is uh, moves in a different direction to what is seen um, from the base. And then obviously you can see there's a, a, a crossover there as you move through the cardiac cycle. And you'll see that then as it continues to, to move on there, that you'll move from that initial counterclockwise basal to an end systolic clockwise basal. So that's how we can track it through the cardiac cycle. But the key point here is that they work in the opposite direction of each other, because that's what creates the twisting motion and that's what creates ejection of uh, blood from the heart there. And, um, oh, so let me just go back here. And um, there's a, a few other uh, uh, parameters that we can see in healthy controls. And this is really demonstrated by this uh, 1B, which is uh, different from the green apical to basal rotation, I said, um, that you can also see in, a healthy, in healthy controls, the absence of the initial rotation in the other direction, but then the normal end systolic clockwise basal and counterclockwise apical rotation. So you can also see the second pattern here, which is denoted by the, the red here. Um, and again, you'll see though, that the uh, the key finding is, is that they're going in different directions in particular as we move through the cardiac cycle, again, resulting in that torsion or twist response. And the thought here is that when there is pathology that uh, uh, significantly impacts um, the myocardial fibers. And if we're talking about non-compaction, we're talking about a pathology where, um, you know, it's thought that obviously the heart, as it goes through its uh, uh, process um, during, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, fetal development, that obviously it comes in a, uh, a non-compacted form and then it actually compacts down on itself. And that's what results in the two uh, 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 layers, that right-hand sided, left-hand sided, endocardial, epicardial fiber orientation. And that what happens if there's abnormality there, such as someone with non-compaction cardiomyopathy, is that they are fixed. So in that particular circumstance there, they move in the same direction. And this can be denoted by sort of uh, four uh, particular uh, ways which, within which we can assess it, um, which in this particular paper was designated 2A, 2B, 2C, and 2D. And essentially what they are, as you'll see here on the right, 
These are the, the two different normal variations. And on the left, these are the four abnormal variations that we can see. But essentially, what they all equate to is that the fibers move in the same direction. They can either go counterclockwise initially um, uh, or clockwise initially, or you can get that absence of that initial counter or clockwise rotation, but then both layers, being the basal and apical, move in the same direction throughout the cardiac, the cardiac cycle. So very different pattern than what we're seeing with that um, counterclockwise, clockwise twisting motion that we see in the normal heart there. And this has been looked at um, in patients with hypertrabeculation, patients with non-compaction cardiomyopathy, based on either expert opinion or uh, the various criteria that have been proposed. As I said, the best is the, 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 the Jenny criteria. And essentially, what we can see here is that um, uh, it, it looks as though this is a very good way to differentiate what is in fact normal in those folks that have hypertrabeculation as in they may have non-compaction phenotype, but non-compaction non cardiomyopathy from those that truly have evidence of a non-compaction cardiomyopathy, where they're much more likely to have that rigid body phenotype and that the uh, myocardial motion moves in the same direction in one of those uh, four patterns there. So uh, based on this, this looks to be a better way to make the diagnosis or confirm the diagnosis of non-compaction cardiomyopathy as opposed just to hypertrabeculation. Um, and so you can see that that there. So this is essentially the uh, the the rigid body rotation. Oh, Sorry about that, I don't know what that is. Okay, so um, so it looks as though this rigid body has a good predictive uh, uh, value for the diagnosis of, um, of, of cardiomyopathy. And in fact, if you don't have it, you need to then reconsider um, the, 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 the diagnosis uh, moving forward. So if we look at um, our customer here, again, you can see this is the, um, the, the purple here is the basal rotation. And then the, the, this, uh, I don't know, sort of light blue color here is the um, apical rotation. And as expected in the normal heart, you can see that they both are rotating uh, in the opposite direction of each other as we go from the start of the cardiac cycle all the way through the cardiac cycle uh, there. And this can simply be measured, as I mentioned, um, with the uh, GE package, you just need to uh, tick, tick the button there and identify which myocardial segments that you're interested in, and then it will plot it out um, uh, graphically uh, here, and then we can obviously time it with aortic valve closure, there being the end of systole and time point zero here being uh, the commencement of systole. So in fact, in our patient, and this, this is his uh, uh, findings, and uh, I asked Erwin how we wanted to do this. And in fact, they did this at the Toronto General because um, Erwin sort of collecting all his diagnostic criteria to help um, identify which patients may have the cardiomyopathy and which patients may uh, have the phenotype. So uh, they did this, but it's fairly easy, uh, something for us to consider moving forward. So you can see here that he really fulfills um, and is identical to that normal uh, 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 pattern that was described in that uh, original patient there. So this is an editorial that uh, Erwin uh, wrote um, uh, to help you know, figure out um, left ventricular non-compaction is a myocardial phenotype cardiomyopathy yes or no there. And essentially what he's uh, doing from here is looking at all the various criteria that we see um, based on the medical history, the ECG, the imaging, family history and genetic testing. How do we then determine what is cardiomyopathy and what is in fact uh, merely a phenotype that uh, does not have a pathological significance there? Now, the other thing you're gonna say is, okay, you're an MRI guy, why didn't you just do an MRI? And as I said, we actually did an MRI, we did it on two occasions. The problem with MRI has been, is as opposed to the echo criteria, which are a bit more stringent, the MRI criteria simply said that if the end diastolic non-compaction to compacted ratio was greater than two, that this may be consistent with the diagnosis of non-compaction cardiomyopathy. 
And the initial paper was done by an Aussie colleague of mine, a guy called Joe Selvanigam. And most of us in the MRI field felt that the paper was wrong and should be withdrawn because it way overdiagnosed. And many, many folks have excessive trabeculation. That does not necessarily mean that you have the syndrome. Unfortunately, the paper hasn't been done, but this is a nice study um, done by a very good group. Um, uh, you know, you know a couple of big names here, you know, Zhao Lima, David Blumke, Stefan Peterson. Um, a, a bit of a, uh, based on this MESA study, which is a 6,000 person MRI study. And they looked at the relationship of ventricular over nine, um, over nine years follow up. So they took a, a number of participants to see, okay, if you saw excessive trabeculation, was this associated with a change in cardiac volumes and function to suggest that in fact, they may go on to, to develop a cardiomyopathy, right? Because the question is, you know, maybe we've just missed it with our current diagnosis here. So they looked at 2,742. Um, you can see mean age 68, 56 had hypertension, 16% had diabetes. And essentially when they broke it down into those who had met the diagnosis of significant trabeculation, whether or not you looked at the extent of the non-compacted to the compacted ratio. So here you see zero to 1.4, 1.4 to 1.7, 1.7 to 2, greater than 2, and then really excessive tuberculation, 2.4 to uh, 5.41. And anything in quintile 4 and 5 based on the previous MRI criteria would be labeled non-compaction cardiomyopathy. You can see if we then follow those patients up and looked at the change in end systolic volume, the change in end diastolic volume, the change in ejection fraction, you'll see here that a one mil change in ESV uh, uh, somewhere between a three to six mil change in e EDV and really a, you know, a very small change in EF, that it does not appear as though the presence of trabeculation per se is driving um, this and that we are missing a large number of folks who have in fact uh, gone on to develop a cutting up. The again, making us question the MRI criteria for the development of, um, of non-compaction cardiomyopathy. Now, um, obviously, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's observational. There may be people that dropped out. There are issues with the data, but overall, at least, it supports that sort of clinical observation that if you use MRI and simply the MRI criteria, you're gonna overdiagnose. So I, I think in, in, you know, in summary, you know, compaction has achieved this sort of popularity. It's, I think for the most part, it is overdiagnosed there. You have to look at a number of criteria. You can't just base it solely on the uh, echo uh, phenotype or the uh, MRI uh, phenotype. And there are cases where it's very difficult to distinguish between physio physiologic um, and pathologic uh, remodeling in the LV myocardium. So what happened to our patient? That's probably the most important thing uh, moving forward. So a couple of extra uh, bits of information. Um, we looked at his MRI again, and in fact, we repeated the MRI, and I asked Bernd Wintersberger at the uh, Toronto General to read it blinded, um, both studies, um, just so that, you know, we, we had a, an unbiased uh, uh, opinion, if you will. Um, his end systolic volume, uh, end, sorry, end diastolic volume was around 320 mils, so when you indexed it, it was around 150 mils per metre squared which for an elite athlete is at the upper end of normal, but is not in fact abnormal. Both his right and left ventricular ejection fractions were within the uh, normal range there. His strain remained unchanged between the two, two scans uh, there. There was no ev evidence of late gadolinium enhancement. Um, he had a genetic testing um, that's offered through the Toronto General Hospital. He was negative uh, for genetic uh, testing. Um, so we wrote a very long letter. I got Erwin to actually write an official opinion uh, as to whether or not he believed this gentleman had uh, non-compaction cardiomyopathy. And um, the summary of that was based on the, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, syncopal episodes, which were felt to be vagal in origin because there was a significant postural component um, based on the normal ECG and the other criteria that he in fact had a uh, 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 LV trabeculation consistent with his uh, uh, African origin and the uh, highly competitive sports. 
that he did not in fact need a uh, defibrillator and that he could continue to go on uh, and play sport provided he had close follow-up. As a backup, we said, um, if he doesn't have an ICD in, a lot of the uh, schools do have uh, defibrillators present in the gym and that when training, um, he should have a coach or other person who um, uh, uh, should be comfortable with the use of that because obviously the school was uh, you know, concerned about the legal risk if he did actually pass out. Um, the school were happy with that. They reported it back to the NCAA and the NCAA said, we don't really care what you think. The Mayo Clinic has said that he has, um, that he has a, 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 no, a non-compaction. He needs a defibrillator. So we then had a big conundrum here as to what to do. In the end, uh, a long discussion with the EP group, he had a subcutaneous ICD placed. Um, we explained the pros and cons very clearly to him that perhaps this is not the optimal form, but it was thought that, you know, the potential risk of an elbow in competitive basketball with uh, leads next to the can may result in dislodgement or displacement. And, and that therefore, uh, given we felt that the risk was low, but that without putting it in, he would be banned um, from uh, 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 ever moving forward in his career. Um, as I said, it wasn't a, a, a hard rule that the NBA uh, have said absolutely no chance. They just usually don't allow people to play with that. So he had his subcutaneous ICD in and he's continued to play NCAA. I don't know if he's been drafted yet. So uh, um, we'll see what happens. This took about a year to go through the criteria. Also, just to let you know that the mayor, as I said, wanted 160,000 US dollars. Sorry, it was US dollars initially, which was around 200,000 Canadian. And uh, I believe that it cost about 20K all up to put the subcutaneous defibrillator in here. So with that, I'll uh, stop. I just thought it was sort of an interesting, uh, you know, case series as we went through this and there's clearly more evolution of this uh, syndrome of non-compaction. Um, but uh, every now and again, it does have pretty, pretty profound impact on, uh, on the individuals when we make these diagnoses. So uh, I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you, Kim. This is a really a fascinating story and uh, um, sort of like learned a number of things. And the most important thing is really uh, not to pass out. And um, I think, you know, the, the, the interestingly, when you look at all the professional leads, they're starting to relax some of the rules about ICDs. I think I've seen it in like um, the National Hockey League, maybe. They're, they're also relaxing some of the rules about, you know, having ICDs and players can be part of it. But it's still an evolving story. Any questions? Kim, it's Bob Howard. So the Mayo, did you talk to the Mayo? Did they have different criteria? What criteria were they using? Sorry, Bob, my speaker just went off. What was that? The Mayo. I mean, did you have conversations with them about the criteria they were using to make this diagnosis? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I contacted um, Mike, um, oh, his name uh, escapes me. Um, Mike, uh, who runs their inherited, inherited aortopathy, uh, sorry, inherited cardiac syndrome clinic, is probably the world expert in long, long QT. He's, uh, he, he took a different history. He felt that the history was associated with cardiac syncope. And when he saw the sort of morphologic variants on the on the uh, echo, he said, this is non-compaction. Um, and I, I actually rang him up, I spoke to him, we had email correspondence, and he's basically just said, I think you're wrong. That was pretty much all the, and that was when uh, he said that, that's when I contacted uh, Paul Dorian and Byrne and Irwin to get extra opinions, because uh, I was, you know, I was like, okay, well, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I, I, you know, Mike's, a, he's a very good doc, he's a very sensible uh, doc, but um, because of the impact on this gentleman's career and what it was going to mean, and I wasn't convinced that he had it because um, usually I've got to say when we uh, when we look at the MRI, although we often base it based on the um, on that criteria, I usually like to see other things that go go with it, such as abnormal strain, such as uh, you know abnormal tissue mapping characteristics. Uh, such as T1 and T2 mapping to suggest that there is myocardial abnormalities there and the presence of late gadolinium enhancement. He didn't have that. And the history I took 
um, you know, when I'd gone back and looked at my notes, was much more that this was sort of vagal mediated and I wasn't convinced that this was cardiac. But uh, yeah, they just sort of said, bad luck. And as I said, it's pretty hard to compete against the Mayo. Um, they, you, the NCAA usually, when they have these cases, send them to the Mayo. That's their sort of go-to. So they actually chartered a plane and sent him to Rochester to get the opinion there. So they'd invested a significant investment. And I think, you know, often for a lot of these things, it comes back to the optics of it. Uh, the, the school's viewpoint is, well, any risk is too high a risk. Um, and uh, the, the, it, once there's differing opinions, they're most likely to go to the conservative approach there. So, but it, but, yeah. it, but it, it, do they not use the, uh, the strain data? Was that there, they stuck straight with, you know, there's syncope and he's got, uh, he's got the, the, the myocardial ratio, that's it. Those are the criteria they use. That there was an event, and it's greater than 2.2 to 1, done. Yeah, exactly. And I can tell you, we've presented other cases like this to, you know, um, you know, the Jack, there's a Jack viewpoint. And as you go around the world, that you know, it's very different in how people management. You know, you really get people who are zealots saying this is very clearly non-compaction cardiomyopathy. You know, you're crazy not to put a device in. And then you get the other folks um, I think people who see a lot more people of, uh, you know, African-American, black descent, yeah, we see a lot more trabeculation in that group. It's much more of a normal variant, but of course it is a spectrum. So we're always a little bit concerned about that, but this always creates a lot of debate there. And, you know, um, I, you know, we were a little bit surprised at how they sort of, the Mayo sort of blew off all that data, um, uh, showing that trabeculation is much, much more common. Um, and, uh, you know, that with the normal ECG and the normal strain. And remember, we had a couple of years of echoes and MRIs showing absolutely no change. Negative genetic testing um, as well. So based on all that, that's why we were more confident. And as I said, um, you know, Paul did a fair bit of digging and was able to get, you know, really, I, I can't remember if he even spoke to one of the paramedics who was the person who picked him up. Like he, he really went through to be very, very confident that this was, so had, the syncope had a postural component in the setting of a number of stresses that was very, very um, uh, clear that um, this was vagal uh, and not, not cardiogenic syncope uh, in, in origin there. We also discussed, just so you know, putting in an implantable loop but again, from the sort of uh, viewpoint of um, uh, an ILR versus a sub-Q ICD, it was felt that if we put an ILR in, they still were never going to let him play. So we had to put in something that could potentially abort an event. That was the only way we could overcome that. So we did discuss the ILR, but that's why that never went, uh, ne never went ahead. Because I said, well, if you're going to put something in, and it's an ILR without the ability to defibrillate, that's effectively going to exclude him from playing as well. Now, there's no strict rule about playing with an ILR, but again, if you're that concerned, they were saying, okay. So, you know, we had a lot of chats with uh, back and forth between the school and here and the EP team as to what we should do. But ultimately, um, the, 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 uh, our client said, look, I want it in. Right, and uh, that was the thing that drove that decision. Fascinating, thank you. It sounds like a doctor house case, <laughs> uh, more and more complicated. So, can you tell us more about your sports medicine clinic at St. Michael's Hospital? Like, who are like, you know, how do we refer to you, and what kind of patients are you looking for? Yeah, so thanks, Chi Ming. Yeah, I so gotta go. That, thanks, Bob. So uh, yeah, so we'll be opening this up shortly. Um, it, we're we're working. It'll be housed in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, the new the new space um, where the structural heart program is currently. Um, uh, Cam Ahmed and and Geraldine uh, run that and have given us a, a, approval with uh, the program. We are trying to identify administrative support at the moment. That's sort of why it hasn't formally opened yet. It's likely to occur on a Tuesday uh, morning, just between 9 and 12. It'll be myself, Paul Anger, and Paul Dorian 
um, will be primarily involved. Essentially, what we're really looking for there is those sort of complex cases where a second opinion is, is required, such as when the diagnosis is uh, unclear, um, uh, because obviously we're trying to set up this group across the city where we can get the right people to provide the right opinions, uh, you know, such as Irwin, if we need further hemodynamic testing, Susanna Max, very interested in it. Obviously our echo lab, our MRI lab, we want to, we want to grow that um, as, as well as along with, you know, appropriate EP testing where it's required there. So I think, uh, you know, uh, clinical diagnosis is, is, is difficult with implications to the patient. Um, where there's a thought that it's a professional athlete, whether you're going to be restricting sport um, or where there's implications for that, or just where there's, uh, you know, concerns in, you know, patient management or follow-up. We've all got patients who have had, uh, you know, cardiac events during sport. You know, when is the right thing to follow up? How long? What should we do with medications uh, and so on? If there's any concerns uh, regarding uh, that. The other thing, groups are those that have significant valvular dysfunction. As you know, for the most part, anything more than moderate valvular dysfunction, we suggest should not undergo intense exercise. And intense exercise medically is documented than greater than seven METs. It's actually not a lot of exercise there. So in those folks, if you want to get uh, more help, say you've got someone with moderate to severe MR, I've got a number of cyclists like that. They want to continue to compete. Those sort of groups we're, we're interested uh, in, in, in seeing uh, there. Um, so uh, obviously we don't expect an avalanche of, uh, of people there. Um, we, when we designed it, we were trying to do it across the Toronto and make it a, a, a true U of T clinic, but for various reasons, it hasn't worked out that way. We have got a website, Sports Cardiology Toronto, um, which has the information on it. And at the moment that gets funneled through the uh, Richard Lua Hart and Stroke Centre. Um, Liz Duo uh, then uh, forwards the information onto our cells, but we're working to sort of streamline that to come uh, through St. Mike's. Um, and as you know, Chi Ming, we have Ryan Quinn starting, who's going to be one of our new ECHO fellows, who's got a specific interest in sports cardiology, and we're looking at developing a few programs uh, 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 along there as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had a few other referrals. One of the guys I've raced against a few times is the world champion in, uh, in cycling in my age group there. And, and he's been banned actually recently because he's had probably some episodes of atrial fibrillation. Um, and so I think, you know, folks like that where it has a big impact on their life or there's clinical conundrum in the diagnosis, then uh, they're the people we want to see or if you're just not certain what to do. Because as you can see, sometimes it's really hard to know exactly what to do. This is one of these areas where there is a bit of an absence of evidence and the opinions differ extremely widely. So that's where we were hoping we would have that sort of, uh, you know, a bit like the heart team model. We would have the athlete's heart model where we have a number of different experts who can weigh in and therefore we can come up with a, you know, a reasonable decision that we think balances everything out as opposed to, um, uh, you, you know, where we don't have evidence, it sort of comes back to, uh, you know, a bit of common sense and, and who's seen a lot of these folks and, and, and what's our, uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding of the long-term natural history based on people seeing a lot of these folks for a long time. Well, that's really exciting. So, wonderful. Yeah. So, right. Looking we're coming up, well. yeah. yeah, we're coming up to the, to the nine o'clock mark. So, once again, thank you for your presentation. It's fascinating. It's great storytelling and uh, you've done great work with uh, helping patients like that. And, um, so let's um, let's uh, let's terminate this, and then we'll uh, wait until uh, we come back to next Thursday.